and welcome to the Rural Doctors Program. I'm Jerry Gannon. Thanks once again for your company. In this program, we take a look at skin cancer, and most of the program comes from a discussion with Fremantle-based dermatologist Dr. Kurt Gebauer that was filmed as a special edition webcast to complement the February 2010 dermatology program. But in response to your positive feedback, we've decided to make it part of our main series of broadcasts. Now, as well as that discussion, we'll also take a closer look at melanoma by heading down to Bunbury and checking out Melanoma Support Group, Melanoma WA. And we'll speak with medical oncologist Dr. Michael Millward about some new drugs for the treatment of metastatic melanoma. But before we begin, I'd like to remind you about our upcoming Fremantle conference. It's at the University of Notre Dame in Fremantle on Saturday the 15th of October, and we have a new format this year. It consists of a full day of interactive clinical updates and workshops. And because of the new format, participants are limited to 60 this year, so if you're thinking of attending, you should register quickly. And we strongly encourage you to book accommodation with your registration. So jump online and register at ruralhealthwest.com.au and we look forward to seeing you for what will be a great weekend. Well now let's join Olga Ward and our guest dermatologist Dr Kurt Gebauer. Kurt, welcome to the program. Thank you for inviting me. Kurt, skin cancer is an extremely common presentation in Australian general practice. Just how prevalent is it in our population? The statistics are quite soft. Most of the statistics are being created 10, 15, 20 years ago. And what they don't correlate with is that the Australian population has changed dramatically. So if you go back 30, 40 years, the Anglo-Saxon component of our population was a lot higher. And that's reflected in what we see in our more elderly patients, the pensioners. So the government like to say that we're doing very well with skin cancer and the rates are levelling off and the rates are improving, but if you actually factor for the change in the dynamic demographics of our population, really if you're white, Anglo-Saxon, Caucasian stock, your cancer rate will be extremely high. So the figures we loosely quote at the moment is roughly almost everyone who's white who lives into their 70s and 80s will get a basal cell cancer. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to get solar keratosis. Probably one in five Australians will get a squamous cell carcinoma. And then depending on where you live, the melanoma rates for the West Coast are roughly one in 20 for males, one in 25 for females for the West Coast. But of course that'll be different if you're living in Kununurra compared to being in Albany. Now, a lot of our particularly farming patients have solar keratosis and terrible, terrible sun damage. How do you tell which of those solar keratoses is going malignant? That's the, the big argument is there are <clears throat> the Americans at the moment are trying to persuade the world that if you analyse a solar keratosis and you look at the individual keratinocyte, the basic unit of the keratosis, that it has all the features of malignancy. So there's a big push out there for those that are more academic that are saying that we shouldn't be using the word keratosis, that these are all cancer. But in Australia we sort of think of biology and we think of what's going to happen to that individual lesion. And the assumption is, and also studies that come out of Melbourne 20, 30 years ago, are that very, very few keratoses will turn into squamous cell carcinoma. Mm. So there are certain companies who are promoting their products will insist that we should ablate, remove, treat every keratosis on every Australian. That's clearly impractical and it's also going to be extremely expensive and also for our patients very painful. But how do we tell which ones are the more suspicious lesions? The more hypertrophic lesions are the ones I'll make sure that I'll treat. So patients who've got very lumpy lesions because they catch on their clothes. These patients have got severe elastic damage so they frequently will tear and bruise. So any of these keratotic lesions that catch and irritate, I usually treat those because the patient wants us to and they become a nuisance. But for malignant transformation, dermatologists are always touching their patients. So we grab the patient and we squeeze the lesion and if they yelp and jump, that's transforming. So mm -hmm. painful keratosis, keratosis with the nodular base which is more in duration, feels a little bit like an ice block under the skin, yeah. they're lesions that we should all be treating. And when you say treating, you're treating them with cryotherapy or are you actually excising them? Depends on the size of the lesion. The more hyperkeratotic keratoses usually don't respond terribly well to freezing and that's because you've got a large lump of dead tissue sitting mm -hmm. on top of the abnormal cell. 
So essentially, if you have the picture of a brick wall where the bottom layer is the abnormal layer and you have a large crust on top, freezing really doesn't get to the base terribly well. My preferred practice is I usually use a hyphricator, or if you haven't got a hyphricator, use a cautery unit, and I just run over the patient with a hyphricator and just gently touch the keratoses and fry them. For very small ones, I do it without local because it's one very sharp little zap and the mm. lesion goes black and falls off over the next week or two. For the larger lesions, you sometimes have to make some, use some local anaesthetic, make them numb and physically debride it. So they can be done with a curette or it can be done with a scalpel blade and then hyphricate or cauterise the base. Yeah. Well, could, could we have a look at a few photos of uh, solar keratoses and can you just talk us through what you're seeing on those pictures? Okay, so the first one we have here is just of a standard limb. It could be an arm or a forearm, but that's the sort of thing that you see in the country and certainly in people who've had a lot of sun in our society. These patients will often come in and complain that their skin feels rough. Usually they actually have a question. They come in and say, well, I've noticed these things or my partner's suggested I need to go and get it checked because they've noticed there's a change in their skin. So quite frequently patients really just want to be reassured that they don't or do have a cancer. And because of the media being such that it's a very high priority, patients often have on their mind that there is something seriously wrong. As a practitioner, just reassuring them that, hey, these are keratoses. Keratoses are dead skin. They're happening because the skin cells have been damaged. I'm in the habit of showing patients their armpit and saying, well, that's really what you should be looking like. That is normal skin. And anything that doesn't look like your armpit is abnormal skin. So that gives them a very clear visual impression of what they've done to their skin over the last 20, 30, 80 years. Mm. So just reassuring patients that, hey, unfortunately in Australia, this is what happens. This happens to all of us. It's just a matter of time. And having a few rough bits of skin on the outer arm or on your leg really aren't that important. Yeah. So when they say, oh, it's just dry skin, you can reassure them that it is just dry yeah, skin. Yeah, it is just dry skin and it's dry skin because the skin cells are going a little bit too quickly because they've been damaged. Sometimes the patients have really lumpy hands um, and you'll kind of squeeze the lumpy bits and some fluid comes out. What's happening there? Dermatology is full of outrageous names, but this one's called colloid milium. So you will see them on people who've had a huge amount of sunlight around the neck, on the back of hands, in farmers particularly. And when you look, it looks a little bit like frog's eggs little bumps and if you're very curious if you rupture one of these with a scalpel blade or a large bore needle you'll find it just exudes gel and essentially what this is is liquefied elastic tissue and collagen. The patients had that much sunlight that they've destroyed the elastic tissue and li liquefied it. There's not much you can do about it therapeutically but occasionally these patients will come in and say what's this or they've noticed it. I've had a couple sent to me as workers compensation cases and I just sort of said no this is just unfortunately the extreme result of being an Australian with sun sensitive skin. Sometimes the patients will see you with things on the face or around the lips. Um, again, how do you tell that they're not having a, um, a large set of SCCs in the making, particularly around the lip? The most common thing that you'll see on the lip, and again very, very common, is leukoplakia. So leukoplakia, it's in the name, leuko, white, plakia, patch. So this, essentially what it is biologically is a solar keratosis on the lip. The reason our lips look pink is because we have thin skin, leukoplakia, the area is growing quicker, so the patient will feel that the skin on the lip is thicker. Often they'll complain of cracking, splitting, fissuring. Again, the test that we would do is grab hold of it and squeeze it. So if it feels flat and it feels scaly and stuck on a little bit like a postage stamp, then you can be reassured that's a superficial lesion. There is some academic argument. This is probably the only thing in the skin that dermatologists and dentists and oral experts will say is pre-malignant. What they mean by that is that if you leave that lesion for long enough, and long enough can be decades, it will in some, most cases, transform. So it's about one of the very few things we'll say if a patient complains of leukoplakia or we identify it, treat it. And it can be easily treated with cryotherapy. So mm -hmm. simple liquid nitrogen with cotton wool bud, or with a liquid nitrogen spraying device, Cryax, the most common one in Western Australia, should work very well. And you just treat it like a normal keratosis. Warn the patient they're gonna get a blister, it'll be uncomfortable, they'll have a cold sore type effect for a week or so, and it should all heal up and go pink. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to get the patient back to check to make sure your therapy's been successful. The patient can quite happily see in the mirror in a three or four weeks time, the white patch is gone, if it's all smooth, you've done your job. 
As a long-term tip, the use of, use of topical retinoids, so tretinoin cream, 0.05%, and there's a number of brands, works very effectively at postponing the eventual recurrence because essentially this is a sign of significant actinic damage. If we can get people to stop smoking, it's another one that we can use to say, hang on, cigarette smoke's damaging your skin. This is part of the process, so that's something that we can do as practitioners is encourage them to stop smoking. But we know that you treat these people and roughly they'll get three to five years of benefit and then they'll be back with another patch of leukoplakia. So if you get them to use topical retinoids every night, that will space out the intervals before the lesions recur. So one of the things I say to patients is, well, after I've finished burning them and they're crying and sobbing, I say, well, did you enjoy that? And the answer is no. Well, I'd like you to put this cream on every night forever because that will minimise the number of times you come back to see me. It's important for the doctors to remember and tell their patients that topical tretinoin in this country is only prescribed, according to the PBS, for acne. So all the information leaflet is all about acne for teenagers. And it specifically says to the teenagers, don't stick it in your eye, don't stick it up your nose and don't stick it in your mouth because they don't have acne there. And that's one of the ones you'll get a phone call from the patient saying, you've given me an acne drug, what's going on here? Mm. So you need to explain it to the patient what, why we're using it and it's quite safe. There's a lot of um, use these days of Effudix and to a certain extent Aldara and is Solaris Diclofenac Yes, topical, that's another one. Um, for keratosis, how effective is it and what should it look like when we're treating it? Um, there are three prescribable field therapies. So this picture is of somebody who has lymphoma. So they're immunosuppressed and as a result of their immunosuppression they're having more problems with keratosis. And this particular patient, a lot of his keratosis because of his immunosuppression were transforming into invasive SECs. So most of us, if we have an intact immune system with keratosis, do quite well because our immune system can regulate. But you'll see in your renal transplant and other immunosuppressed patients, you may find suddenly they start to get a lot more squamous cell carcinoma. Effidex is, I hesitate to use the word gold standard, but it's the oldest treatment. It's been around for at least 40, 50 years. Effidex is five fluorouracil. It's chemotherapy. So mm -hmm. it's an agent that we prescribe. Mm -hmm. One of the main issues with Effidex is it's photosensitising. So as soon as they go to the chemist, the first thing the chemist will say, oh, you can't use this and go in the sun. And that's a silly comment because it's nearly always sunny everywhere in WA. It's a topical agent, best applied twice daily. It does work extremely well on the head and neck. And the mechanism of action is that it poisons DNA. So if you have rapidly growing lesions, solar keratosis, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, they suck up the effidex, it poisons the DNA and the tissue dies. So you must get cell death. So the patient will get red, eroded, sore, painful skin. I say to my patients, you will look and feel like someone has poured kerosene on your face and lit it with a match. People will cross the road to avoid you. So you'll look quite awful and it is uncomfortable. Treatment for facial keratosis, depending on skin type, so very pale Anglo-Saxon skin, twice a day for two weeks. Darker skin types like me might need three to four weeks of treatment twice daily to get to that point. But it's always horrible, it's always painful, and it does sting and burn a lot more if you get out and about in the sun. How blistery is too blistery? If they're starting to weep, so when you get those phone calls from the patients go, Doc, this is terrible, I'm very uncomfortable, you know, it's all gone terrible because as soon as they flare up, they go to the chemist who will say, oh my God, that's awful, you're having a reaction, ring the GP immediately. And you get that regularly if you're using this medication. So if I get the phone call, my question that I ask them, is it wet? Is it moist? Is it weeping? So certainly if they get to that stage, which means that they basically destroyed their epidermis and tissue fluids soaking through, then that's more than enough and then they can stop. With the other two treatments, so that's the amiquimod and the diclofenac, same sort of reaction? No, the mechanism the action is totally different. So Solarase is the most recent prescribable agent in Australia. Yep. Overseas it's been available for 10 to 15 years, and that's diclofenac with hyaluronic acid. It's an anti-angiogenic, it's a COX-2 inhibitor. So essentially the way it works is that it reduces blood flow. All abnormal tissue now requires blood flow, so the logic is that if we reduce blood flow, then the abnormal tissue will recede, die off. So for our mechanism of action is through vessels, so it's a very slow acting agent. It's twice a day for three months. 
So a lot of the ladies go, yeah, that's fine, that's no trouble, I can put it on, it's a clear gel, it's quite compatible with normal activity, so you can put your sunblock straight over the top, the ladies who want to use makeup, they can put makeup straight over the top so they can put their solar rays on, put the tube down and immediately put their sunblock on or immediately put their moisturiser on. It's a clear gel that vanishes in very quickly. It does not photosensitise, so that's also quite ha unique. But probably it's true to say it's the mildest of the treatments. So for those people that come in who just have some mild dryness of their skin, for people to say, I've got flaky bits on my nose that sting, or when I'm getting out and I sweat, my face stings and burns, or the ladies say my makeup catches, Solrose is the ideal product for them. The pleasant bit about it is seven out of eight patients feel nothing, look totally normal. So they don't get any inflammatory reaction, they don't get any abnormality or discomfort. And there are some patients who are allergic to the ingredients, but normally you find in the men they've gone through a third of a tube in a week or so because it's so easy to spread, it vanishes, they don't think they've put enough on, so they put a bit more on and then they burn themselves. Mm -hmm. Or on the ladies who spot treat, because if they spot treat certain areas, what they're doing is overdosing that small little area of skin and that will burn. So I try to restrict my patients who are using this agent, Solarase, to use one tube only for that entire three month process. If they do that, it's very uncommon to get a problem. What about amiquimod? Amiquimod is an immune stimulant. So it's a non-toxic cream, comes in these strange little sachets, these little bags, so the packaging yeah. is quite odd. And what it does is you rub it on and essentially it soaks through your skin and it makes your immune system activate. So you're essentially training your defense system to find any abnormalities in your skin, whether they're keratoses, whether it's squamous cell carcinoma in situ, whether it's a basal cell, the immune system can't differentiate. So what should happen is those lesions will go red. So the immune system attacks it, they go red and it gets inflamed. So it's a very quick drug. So I tell my patients to put it on until it goes red and as soon as it goes red, then they stop applying the medication. Seal the sachet, because the company will say, rip the top off a sachet, use a bit and throw it out. They cost roughly 15 to $25 a sachet. You don't throw anything out and you use them for as long as you can. Kurt, earlier you were talking about Bowen's disease and uh, you said that you could use Effudix with Bowen's disease. Mm -hmm. I'm presuming that you can use the other topical treatments for that as well? There are many ways of treating these lesions. So for the smaller ones, they respond very well to cryotherapy. Um, the proper word would be cryosurgery. That's where you freeze it. You need to use a liquid nitrogen container and you need to keep the thing frozen solid, double freeze cycle. So the standard, you freeze it until it's rock hard, then you wait for it to defrost entirely. Some of us who are sometimes in a bit of a hurry have been taught to put your finger on and to warm it up. That's not the way you treat cancers. You allow it to defrost naturally because the mechanism of action is freezing causes ice crystals and the little ice crystals rupture the cells mm. and that's what causes cell death. So if you try to rush it or defrost it, the ice crystals don't do their work. So it takes probably five to ten minutes to freeze something properly if you're doing a double freeze cycle. Surgery works extremely well. Um, curatage works very well. There are some clinics that have lasers and fancy devices. Um, I'm a cream person. I like therapy. I like medications that I can prescribe, that the patient can apply, that are easy to use. And certainly, Effidex cream has been, again, the gold standard for many, many years. It does work extremely well. All of these agents, all of these modalities, roughly have the same success rate at five years and ten years. There's nothing that's 100 yeah. percent. So how do you actually identify Bowen's disease? What is it about it that, uh, that makes you think, okay, that's not just <coughs> redness on the background yeah. of keratoses? Bowen's disease has a particular colour. They're bright, bright red. And you'll see from the images that we have here, the examples, they have this very red, angry colour. And they also look sort of almost glistening and moist. While keratoses are particularly dry, seborrheic keratoses are very dry. It's very simple to do a little shave biopsy, a little punch biopsy. So there's a very large lesion on the leg that we've provided as an example. So if you imagine trying to fix that surgically, it would be very, very difficult. So if you're out in the country, or even in the city for that matter, if you're not sure, confirm it with a little shave biopsy or a little punch biopsy. You get the pathology report saying, yes, it's Bowen's. Bowen's hardly ever metastasizes and hardly ever invades. For some reason these have a lateral growth phase and they'll just slowly over years get bigger and bigger and bigger. I have seen a very few that have actually developed invasive squamous cell carcinoma rising in a park of Bowen's disease. It must be less than 10. I've been a dermatologist for 20 something years now. 
So it's most unusual. So don't worry, if it feels flat, it is flat and you can treat it topically. Now what about that patient with the Bowen's disease very close to the eyelid? Yes, um, that's a specialised area. Same goes for lips. My wife's an ophthalmologist and I seem to collect a number of these patients from her colleagues who feel that surgery is going to be a major issue, so they send them to me. And again, we get down to fine print. So if you read the Effidex fine print, it uses these wonderful words, do not go too close to and it's something written by lawyers, so when we're trying to explain to our patients what do the words too close to an edge mean, it's like mum saying be good or don't go too close to the edge. There is absolutely no reason why you can't use Effidex, Aldara, Solarase on the lip. It's just that it wasn't studied, or on the ear, or on the nose, or on the eyelid. Um, Effidex, if it gets onto the conjunctiva, burns and stings, very much like you've put shampoo in. Um, so does Aldara. But certainly, if I was going to be treating an eyelid lesion, I'd be saying to patients, maybe just at night, immediately before they go to bed, they apply the treatment. So if we were going to be using Effidex twice a day, three weeks, if it was a cheek lesion, like the one on the temple, it should work very well. But if it was an eyelid, I'd be just using it at night and doubling the time. So I'd be saying to the patient, I just want you to put this on at night, because there's less chance of them rubbing their eye, smearing it, getting it into their eye and that will just cause a local chemical irritation, it won't do anything nasty, but they'll go a lot, lot longer to get the therapeutic response that we want. Mm. And the same goes for Aldara. But at least it saves them having some surgery on their eye. Yeah, they end up with normal skin, they have a normal reaction, and this is something that can be done in the country, can be done at home. It's mm -hmm. very easy, very simple, and you as a practitioner can monitor it. These areas, because they're more specialised, you certainly want to make sure that you'll see the patient a few times during their th treatment, because it's a longer therapy course, try and ensure compliance, make sure that they're using the correct technique, make sure that they're responding. So I'll be saying to the general practitioner, well in this case you will want to get the patient back at three weeks, four weeks, hold the hand, check how they're going, and then possibly review them six, eight weeks after the treatment's completed to make sure it's successful. When does it fail? Effidex fails for two reasons. One is compliance, and it's nearly always compliance. Yep. Australians, if they can't get things done in three to five days or two weeks, they don't do it and that's universal, particularly with the men. Um, and secondly, if the lesion isn't growing quickly enough, or well, we've picked the wrong lesion. So it says in the Effidex information that it's useful for basal cell. So if you go and look for the studies, Effidex predates proper science. It doesn't work particularly well for basal cells at all. I would never use it on a basal cell, despite the fact it says in the information leaflet that we can. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because these are so slow growing that that DNA poisoning effect, the mechanism of action, is unlikely to happen. And there are always exceptions. There's always some patient who hasn't done it well or they tell you they have done it well or they didn't put enough on, technical issues. That's why I would review them. Aldara, on the other hand, works through a receptor called toll receptors. So the actual malignant cells express these little flags called toll receptors and they've discovered these things and they do many other things in the body. And there are some cancers that don't have a lot of toll receptors. So you may have had the since situation, I recently had a lady who I was treating four superficial basal cell carcinomas with Aldara. And three led up and did exactly what you expected and went away, and one just sat there. And the biology is that that particular cancer clone doesn't have a lot of toll receptors. So a way to try to stimulate more toll receptors is we go back to our tretinoin, vitamin A cream, the one we mm -hmm. discussed earlier. Yep. So if you put tretinoin, vitamin A cream, on a tumour, you do that for a week or two as pre-treatment, <coughs> it will secrete more toll receptors. So it will make it a lot more visible to the Aldara effect. So if you're getting a lesion that you're treating with Aldara and it really doesn't seem to be responding, and you're certain it's a BCC, and you're certain that your diagnosis is correct that it's Bowen's or keratosis, not that you're sticking it on a melanoma or a Seb K that your diagnosis is wrong. So if you're certain on biopsy that that's what it is, stop the therapy, put tretinoin on for two, three weeks, I get my patients to put the tretinoin at night and then use the Eldara in the morning simultaneously. So three, four weeks of vitamin A cream and then run with the Eldara and the vitamin A together and normally it will react. And we'll come back to that discussion in just a moment. Australia has one of the highest rates of melanoma in the world, with a thousand people being diagnosed each year. To find out about what sort of support and education is available for people living with melanoma, we went down to Bunbury and had a chat to Clinton Heal, CEO and founder of Melanoma WA 
and local GP, Dr. Gavin Matten. Melanoma WA was founded in 2008 and really it was started because there was a, a real need for information for melanoma patients uh, out there in Western Australia and uh, that was I guess found out through my own personal journey with metastatic melanoma and uh, from there what was started as an information website has really grown into a support network as well and uh, that exists in uh, physical groups where people with melanoma and their family and friends come together to, to talk about the issues surrounding living with melanoma but uh, also that support network spreads across the state and uh, you know we can use things like with technology, uh, video conferencing and things like that so that we can really expand out and support anyone across the state that's uh, living with melanoma and, and wants a, a helping hand or someone to, someone to talk to that's going through the exact same thing as them. And I actually met someone uh, before Melanoma WA was started that was going through their own mel melanoma journey and that really helped me to talk to that person. So that was really the spark, I guess, to, to, uh, to start a support network for Melanoma WA. Once a, a melanoma has been confirmed, the guidelines suggest that we should follow patients in three months, and then again three months thereafter, and then six monthly for two sessions, so for, for 12 months, and then 12 monthly. Essentially though, even when we're doing that, with a thorough check at those intervals, we may well miss the very rapidly growing, more aggressive melanomas, the uh, desmoplastics, the uh, amelanotics, and therefore it's essential to train our patients in checking themselves, training them to you know, look for the, the odd lesion, the, uh, the one that looks different to the others, uh, training them on the, um, or educating them on the essential salient features uh, of a mole that would suggest that it may be malignant, and if they think that it is malignant, to encourage them strongly to present uh, for an earlier check, either to yourself or to any doctor, wherever they may be. So I think, I think um, the follow-up uh, after a primary excision of a melanoma is essential because the risk of a repeat primary melanoma is significantly high, certainly higher than the risk of a secondary melanoma. I guess uh, what Melanoma WA can provide is, is information. Uh, the website melanomawa.org.au is there as a resource for them to, to tap into. Along with that website is a lot of uh, contacts, such as uh, myself as the CEO of Melanoma WA, and people are more than welcome to contact me directly through the website. And uh, given that we are sort of very much in our infant stages, and uh, we really are looking to expand across the state and really finding where the people are who are living with melanoma and also the people who could really benefit from uh, having some support from uh, an organisation such as Melanoma WA. So we'd be really, uh, you know, really keen into the future to, to develop groups across the state uh, to really um, support people in their own towns versus uh, only just focusing on sort of Metro WA. Picture for example the patient who comes in and melanoma is suspected, excised, confirmed, uh, fully excised with the required margins. They may have a chat with the doctor and the doctor may impart as much knowledge and support as he can in that consult. The patient walks out the door and invariably remembers two or three things from the consult. Uh, we'll have many, many questions, no doubt, that'll come up in their mind over the next you know, few weeks or months. And a group like Melanoma WA is fantastic for that patient to, to plug in to a network of other people who have walked a journey with melanoma uh, and doctors who are involved in the group um, and ask their questions and share their stories and they, they often learn a lot more about the disease of melanoma in a support group like that and not only do they learn a lot more but they often get really encouraged when they see other people who have walked a similar road and survived for a long time and, and may uh, be relieved to see that melanoma is um, is a word and not a sentence. You know, melanoma is such a serious uh, disease and a serious cancer, but um, we do like to give people the real hope that they can live past their diagnosis and, and their prognosis. I, for example, have been living with metastatic melanoma for six years and have had 34 metastatic melanomas removed from throughout my body and I, I really have a passion for uh, you know, seeing people in these support groups and really, uh, I guess, hopefully giving them a little bit of uh, hope and inspiration that they too can, uh, can live well with melanoma. 
Thanks to Clinton, Dr. Matten, and everybody down at the Bunbury Support Group. Let's now return to our discussion with Dr. Olga Ward and Dr. Kurt Gebauer. Kurt, can you tell us a little bit about KAs and what's pathognomonic about them? So the term keratoacanthoma is a, again, it's an older descriptive term for a particular lesion. So traditionally, a keratoacanthoma is a rapidly growing keratotic tumour. So it looks like a dome-shaped squamous cell carcinoma, like a volcano, and has a keratotic plug, and that's very characteristic. They erupt, they hurt when you squeeze them and knock them, mm -hmm. as do all squamous cell carcinomas. If you fiddle and play with them, you get that induration effect that there is a base deeper in the dermis. And the history is that they're rapidly growing. So when the patient presents to us as the practitioner, particularly the general practitioner, you're looking at something and you go, well, that's a rapidly growing smooth lesion with a keratotic plug. It's probably a squamous cell carcinoma. In hospital practice, it's great because if we work in England where it takes patients six months to get through to see the hospital doctor or the specialist, quite frequently they'll come in with a little envelope or a bottle and say, well, here's my skin lesion. It fell off. So a keratoacanthoma is a self-healing, well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So what happens is in time, your own natural immune system kicks in and kills this thing off and it disappears and it'll leave a crenulated, sort of punched out, sort of ugly chicken pox sort of scar, which is what happens naturally. Yeah. So we only know it's a KA, historically, if it does fall off. So my largest keratoacanthoma was the size of the back of a hand. So these lesions for us as practitioners, when you're faced with them, you go, I don't know how qu quickly it's going to grow. I don't know how big it's going to grow. And pathologically, looking at the outside, you can't actually tell what the nature of the skin cells are. So our advice invariably would be treat it. So treat it as you would a squamous cell carcinoma. And whether that's by excising it or radiotherapy, etc. Topical therapies don't work particularly well with large and nodular bulky lesions, whether it's a basal cell or squamous okay. cell. So where we talked about Ephidex and Aldara and Solrays, these lesions, the nodular ones, the KAs, the well-differentiated squamous cell carcinomas, it's really a surgical destructive modality of treatment that's required. And certainly if you treat them, you usually end up with a much nicer cosmetic result if you treat a KA than if you wait for natural resolution. So what is it about those, uh, a lesion that makes you think SCC? So squamous cell carcinomas, patients nearly always will present to you, the doctor. So if you ask patients, what is a skin cancer? They will all go rapidly growing painful lump. So that somehow is embedded in our psyche that that is bad. Mm -hmm. So the patients who will get them, invariably for the first week or two, they'll think, oh, it's a wart or it's a pimple or it's some infection, some knock. But after two to three weeks where the thing hasn't resolved and in fact doubled or tripled in size, most patients will go, this is wrong. Or one of their family members say, no, you need to see the doctor. The exception is old men. For some reason, old men, and that's the men in their 80s plus, who will choose to ignore it. It's not that they don't know it's there, they'll just go, oh no, I don't need to see the doctor, and they do that with many other things, as we all know. And quite frequently you'll discover quite an obvious squamous cell carcinoma, an old man, and you say, well, what's that? Oh, that's nothing, that's a wart, and they're not bothered by it. Mm. I've and had that for 10 years, yeah. We get that all the time, and we have to, practitioners go, no, that's not right, this needs to be fixed, and we're going to fix it now, type thing. Because invariably, if they leave, you won't get hold of them, you won't find them again. But the vast majority of patients will go, this is wrong, it's a rapidly growing painful nodule. And again, clinically, if you just squeeze it, you just grab it and squeeze it, they'll yelp, they'll jump. They're painful. And why they're painful has never been explained. Nobody understands why squamous cell so is painful. So it's not painful. neural invasion or anything? It's not neural invasion, it's, it's inherent to the lesion. And we've all had that experience when you're removing these things. If you remove a basal cell, same amount of local anaesthetics, same procedure, no trouble from the patient. Squamous cell carcinoma, you touch it, it hurts, it not, even with full local anaesthetic, they still complain that it's painful sometimes. How often would you see those metastasizing from something that size? It's extremely uncommon. The, the dangerous lesions are the immunosuppressed, so patients with transplants and there are more of those around, patients on biological agents for their psoriasis or arthritis are considered at higher risk. Patients who are just generally infirm for whatever reason, yep. you know, CLL, chronic lymphoid, leukocytic yeah. leukemias, those sort of patients, they're the ones we would be a lot more aggressive about in that we'd be 
a lot more certain than we make sure that lesions are completely and adequately excised and treated correctly. Um, traditionally, two centimetres is the cutoff point. So it's said that the patients who have large lesions, and again, they're the ones that present late, so there's a patient issue. Yep. Large lesions, so greater than two centimetres, they're the ones that generally tend to metastasize. I've had very few patients with smaller lesions that have run into trouble, but it, you can be unlucky. Mm. Ears, noses, lips are again a very high risk sites. So anything that's on an ear, nose or lip that you have a suspicion of being a squamous cell carcinoma, probably biopsy it, treat it surgically rather than thinking about putting some cream on and freezing it and then coming back to it later. They're areas that we'll be going, no, we will check this to make absolutely mm. sure that we know. And just cut a really generous margin and on it. And we'll fix it properly. And certainly once you've removed it, there are other things like if I have something that's been poorly differentiated that I remove, I will get the patient back a month later and check. And those characteristic things are peri perivascular, perineural invasion, where the pathologist reports that this has a more infiltrative growth pattern or it's picking out nerve fibres and vessels. Again, to the practitioner, this is a patient that you want to make sure you have a very wide margin of excision and also follow the patient up. And if they ever turn up with neuralgic symptoms, be very suspicious because these can be very infiltrative and wide-ranging tumours. Yeah. Kurt, sometimes BCCs look very like SCCs. Definitely. Um, amongst the dermatologists, we play games and we've also there have been trials where we compare our accuracy and skill levels. And the things that I would misdiagnose, and I probably use that term incorrectly, where you'd be looking at a nodular tumour. The mm -hmm. patient, the history could be, oh, it's a couple of weeks, and we all know that sometimes patients embellish or alter or present themselves in a better light to us because they're worried that we're going to yell at them or something. So frequently the history you're given may not be factually correct. And quite commonly there are lesions where I'll go, oh, that's a basal cell carcinoma, and I'll write that on the request form, remove it, and I'll get back from the pathologist, no, Kurt, you're wrong, it's a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Yep. BCC, SCC, it doesn't matter because small BCCs, SCCs are a locally aggressive lesion and they need to be treated and the treatment will be successful. So the example that we're showing which looks very scaly and rather like the previous SCCs is in fact a BCC. It's a BCC because it was removed and the pathologist said it was a BCC and I agree if you, you ask me what do you think, I'd be going, oh, if I had to put my money on one thing I'd say that's a squame yeah. without a history and even with a history I thought it was yeah. a squame. The reason we're using that as an example is that's something that happens to all of us clinically, commonly. BCCs can be quite subtle as well as your typical pearly edge taped up sort of lesion and they often occur on a background of many, many actinic keratoses. Um, how do you pick where the BCC is? There are a number of varieties and many different varieties of basal cell carcinoma. And most of the textbooks and the things that we use as learning agents have all been written by British or Northern American. So the British Northern American basal cell is that classic pearly white telangiectatic nodule on the head, which in the Australian population, especially in the current tree, is totally incorrect. The most common basal cell carcinoma is the superficial multifocal basal cell carcinoma. Yeah. And they're those flat red patches. Flat, can't feel them, it's something you see, they're bright, bright, bright red. And one of the things you'll see dermatologists will do frequently is we'll stick our thumb in something, press, and then take our finger away. And what we're looking for is tumours have abnormal blood flow. So a tumour will slowly, the red will come back over five, 10 seconds. While if it's a patch of psoriasis or it's a burn or a graze, the red returns immediately once you take your thumb away. So that's a clinical thing that we do regularly. Mm. But they're the most common ones and they respond extremely well to Aldara and surgery. Very small lesions can be treated with cryosurgery. But the more tricky problematic ones is the morphic. Morphic is where really there's not that much to see but when you feel you feel there's a large plaque there's this hard lump in the skin. And morphic is a Latin word for leather which implies that the basal cell is growing and burrowing through the collagen and elastic bundles. So these ones invariably have a much wider margin of involvement than we see clinically and the the tip is that if you've excised a morphic basal cell carcinoma and it's closest to the edges, then really you need to go back and make sure that another piece of tissue is removed. So they have a much more invasive growth pattern. So a nodular BCC, 
you know, textbook standard teaching is you should have a five millimetre margin. Really, one to two millimetres is plenty. But if it's a morphic basal cell carcinoma, you've got a one, two millimetre margin, I'd be very concerned that that lesion invariably will come back. And basal cells recur slowly. Squamous cells, you know very quickly, normally you're in trouble. So you treat something, in six months or 12 months, if that's going to recur, the patient will have trouble. But basal cells, you can go five years, eight years, longer, and then you'll find the recurrences. And frequently, as a general practitioner, these patients, once they get one tumour, are going to grow on and get other tumours. A common trip, trick for younger doctors is when patients come in and show you something, that's great. Address what that is, what their concerns, answer that lesion. But also take the opportunity to get their clothes off and have a look around. Because invariably patients will show you one thing, but mm -hmm. will have something more important tucked away that they might show you if you ask them, or they know it's there. And I've had all sorts of patients play games on me with it. They knew they had a melanoma and they showed me something first, and they were just sounding me out to see what I was like before they showed me their melanoma. Mm. And we've all had that in practice, the by the way doc, well, what do you think about this? So there was something more significant at the back of their yeah. mind, or they've totally missed it. And they didn't appreciate because they were male and they didn't look at their back or whatever. So use every opportunity to get their clothes off, do a full skin examination because you'll be surprised. You'll quite, mm. quite frequently find in that group they'll have something more significant yeah. tucked away. The pigmented lesions are the things that often freak GPs out and certainly are the things that the patients worry the most about. Um, we often see some malignant transformation in some of the pigmented lesions. Could you just talk us through that? This is probably the thing that we worry about the most. That's all of us. Mm. There is no easy answer and um, often you get asked, you know, what's your tip? What's the secret? How do you do it? And the answer is it's a very difficult area. So the obvious melanomas, the obvious things, that's everyone's happy with that. It's the ones where we sit back and we go, gee, and there's a whole bunch of tools, dermatoscopes and screening systems and all sorts of things that have been developed and will continue to be developed to help increase our accuracy. But <clears throat> often it's a clinical feel, it's yep. an intuition, and also the patient will sometimes express in their body language is such that there is something about that particular thing that they're showing us. So I'm in the habit if patients show me a lesion, for whatever reason I go, why is it that you're showing me this particular spot? Um, and often you'll find that somebody said something or whatever, but in the way they interact with you, in the way they talk about it, you will after time realise that there are patients who are using language that you'll see time and time again which will make you think there is something significant about this spot. Yeah. With the melanotic freckles, the Hutchinson's melanotic freckle, I often find patients will say, oh no doctor, that's been there for years and mm. years. Um, whereas you, having known them for a few years, sort of think, mm, that's growing. Um, how do you convince them to have that removed? And they're often quite big. How do yeah. you remove the jolly things? Frequently in those cases, I do do a biopsy. It's difficult and most practitioners will say in a very pure world we shouldn't be biopsying melanoma. We shouldn't be biopsying, we should totally remove a lesion. But as you said, there's patients who have very large lesions and if we're not at all convinced that this is malignant, is it a seborrheic keratosis or is it a lentiger that's slowly evolved or we've seen them at the end of summer where it's a little bit darker and you're really not sure, a healthy incisional biopsy, a bit of normal skin, two thirds at least of the lesion, and see what the pathologist says. A correct pathologist will sometimes say, well, until you send me the entire lesion, I'm not going to give you an answer. Really what I want the pathologist to say is, what do they see? I want them to describe down the microscope what they're seeing. And essentially I say to the patient, I want to find out, is this made of dodgy melanocytes? or is it not dodgy melanocytes? So it's easy for the pathologist to say, no, this is an entirely an epidermal keratotic process, seborrheic keratosis. Or they'll say, no, it's a freckle, or the lone tiger. But if they see melanocytes in this lesion and the melanocytes are atypical, that means to me that this off. is a lesion that needs to be treated. And yes, they are extremely slow growing and sometimes it's difficult because we're faced with someone who's very old or very ill or very infirm and it's a difficult decision. Do we put patients through a lot of agro? And traditionally the radiotherapists in this country aren't keen on treating flat melanocytic lesions. So we're really looking at some sort of surgical process and surgery can be quite devastating. Yeah. 
Now, some of these other examples of melanomas um, that you've got here aren't showing a great deal of pigment. How would you pick those? The Australian public through the media have been told to expect sort of dramatic changes in black things. So often you'll find patients will come in and point out a perfectly symmetrical black dot and go, I'm worried about that. And you go, well, it's symmetrical, it's minute, and it's incredibly dark. That's an active junctional nevus. Or they'll pick on black things. Really the message has been obscured by the media. What we're looking for is something that is roughly at least two to three millimetres wide. Because trying to pick the earliest melanoma changes is extremely difficult. You get someone's shirt off and there's a sea of freckles and moles and blotches and sebkes and you stand back and you just think, this is mind blowing. So how do we approach that? I usually would say to people, look, anything's under two, three millimetres wide, just forget about. Because if it is a melanoma in three months, four months, it will be two, three millimetres wide. Anything that's lumpy, forget about. So a nodular melanoma is obviously bad. So just like yep. a squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma, rapidly growing lump. So if a patient comes in and shows you a rapidly growing lump, whether it's pink, whether it's white, whether it's red, it's wrong, Cut it off. Cut it yep. off and get it tested. So patients, uh, sorry, pr GPs will often ask me, they were worried about amelanotic melanoma, they're extremely rare. We're worried about nodular melanoma. These are vascular rapidly growing tumours which will tell you for all other purposes this needs to be checked. So don't worry about those ones. So if it's flaky or crusty, it's a SEBK. So if it's palpable, you'll see a dermatologist will look around and we'll point at a lesion which is a certain size. And we actually, our brains work on outline. So they've done tests where they've done it all in black and white. So no colours at all, just outline, and the dermatologist is actually focusing on the edges. Mm. So something but, that looks like a rat's been munching at the edges. Yeah, it's got to look weird. <clears throat> the ugly duckling is a word that people sometimes say, and then we'll come in and we'll have a pick. And the reason we're picking is because the ones that normally confuse us is seborrheic keratosis, because they look quite irregular and they get knocked around. So if it's scaly or flaky, invariably we'll just discard it. But if it's not apparently flaky, and when you pick, you've got to pick with your nail. So when you're asking patients, they always rub it with their fingertips. Fingertips aren't sensitive enough. The nail, it's like scratching on a blackboard, you get that crusty feel. But there are some seborrheic keratoses or lentigos that are so flat that you really can't tell. So then we'll magnify it with magnifiers, a loop, dermatoscope, something like that. And then it's always lovely if you actually ask the patient, say, well, what's happened with that? But normally you get, I don't know. Or, what? Oh, is it there? You know, very few patients, sometimes it's on a leg or whatever, will say, no, no, I've had that for years, but it probably, in my experience, is 10% of patients. Yeah. We feel something, and then we look at it. Or it itches, and then we look at it. And cancers invariably don't itch. So as a diagnostic tool, something that's itchy means to me they've knocked it, they've bit, it's been bitten, it's been scratched, it's been irritated. Itch means to me inflammation. The other one is sudden, so when people come in and say, I didn't have this last week, I'm not interested. Because whatever they're going to show me isn't cancer. Cancer is two cells, four cells, 16 cells, 64 cells. There's an evolutionary process over weeks and usually months. Mm -hmm. So anything that definitely wasn't there last week, whatever they're showing you is nothing of concern. And finally, Kurt, I had a, a very tragic patient who uh, had dropped a box on his toe and six months later thought the bruising was still there and he had a subundual melanoma. Um, can you just talk us through diagnosing those? And yeah. I suppose the treatment is pretty much always amputation or pretty radical surgical excision. Certainly um, <clears throat> the original classification of melanoma by Wallace Clark, they used the term acral melanoma. And acral melanoma is these weird melanomas. Well, melanoma is in weird places. So ocular melanoma is not that uncommon, and that yeah. has nothing to do with the sun. Um, melanoma can appear anywhere. So again, the Australian public has this idea that because I didn't go in the sun this week or this month or this summer, I'll be okay. No. The Australian public has this idea that um, I have to have stuck it in the sun for 53 years to get a melanoma. And the answer is again is no. You can be unlucky. And one of the things I say to all my patients, because I invariably mess up their hair and I make them take their shoes and socks off and I wave their toes in the air. And when I'm doing that, I say to them, remember Bob Marley. Bob Marley died from a melanoma from his right big toe. He had a subungual melanoma and that's what killed him. And Bob was black. So I say that to patients just to impress on them. They hang on, this can be weird. 
and you get vaginal melanomas, rectal melanomas, and melanomas yep. anywhere. But again, because it's not in an obvious site, patients will sort of choose to ignore it. So to all intents and purposes, the story is wrong, but he didn't do anything about it. And yeah, in those locations, um, surgery by someone who, who's tr trained in dealing with those. So there are some surgeons who have seen a number of these lesions, amputation if it's a particularly bad one, but frequently if it's just under the nail, they can end up with mm -hmm. retaining the, the bone, retaining the pulp, and just having a split skin graft done over the nail surface is usually the best outcome. So are you looking mostly at a plastic surgeon or an orthopaedic surgeon? Well, any surgeon who's good at doing these. So, you know, the whole thing about surgery is, you know, there's no reason why... What have why you done last week? <coughs> yeah, whatever, you know, general practitioners who do a lot of surgery are used to doing that can do that. Yep. Plastic surgeons, orthopods, we all have people who we know and people who we trust and people we deal with that we have a working relation with. Um, ring them up. Great. Kurt, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. And a big thank you to Dr. Kurt Gebauer for sharing his time and considerable expertise with us once again. Now, there have been some stories in the media recently making impressive claims about some new drugs for the treatment of melanoma. We caught up with Dr. Michael Milward, Head of Medical Oncology at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, and asked him about these new treatments. The large majority of patients with melanoma should be detected early and cured with surgical treatment. But there are a group of patients who don't do well and who develop metastatic melanoma. And until recently, we've had little in the way of good treatment for these patients. But recently, there's been two new medications uh, that have looked showing quite a lot of promise. The first is a drug called bemurafenib, which inhibits a specific mutation in melanoma called BRAF, B-R-A-F. And about half of melanomas have this mutation. And we're not exactly sure why, but it appears that it's more common in younger patients with melanoma. So certainly for those unfortunate younger patients who develop metastatic melanoma, uh, we think about testing them for this mutation. And if their melanoma does have the mutation, then treatment with a drug like vermurafenib is looking very promising. And the results are much better than with the older chemotherapy treatments that we used to use for metastatic melanoma. I think for patients who live in rural or remote areas, then a drug like vermurafenib is attractive because once patients are stabilised on it, they are not likely to require very frequent attendances for treatment and so some monitoring could certainly be undertaken, although they would probably need to come and be reviewed by their oncologist maybe every six, eight weeks or so once things are stable. Um, but again, uh, that's a lot more easy than chemotherapy or other types of treatments that we've used. Uh, Vemurafenib is a tablet, so it's very convenient for patients because it's taken just as a daily dose of tablets. Uh, and although it's got some side effects, for most patients it's very well tolerated and over half of patients with melanoma that spread or metastasize, if it does have this mutation, will have a very favorable response to drugs like vermurafenib. And sometimes these responses can be quite long, although in many patients they only last about nine to 12 months or so and we're doing a lot of research to try and work out why that is and why melanomas can become resistant. The other drug that there's been a lot of publicity about uh, is a drug called ipilimumab, which is also known as Yervoy. Uh, rather a difficult name, but anyway, Yervoy is what it's been uh, designated. And this is a very different treatment for metastatic melanoma. It's an antibody treatment that works on the patient's immune system and in essence tries to fool the patient's immune system into recognising melanoma as a foreign substance and mounting an immune response against it. Uh, and again, this drug is showing promise in metastatic melanoma, not dramatically 
good results and probably not as good as vemurafenib for patients with a BRAF mutation. But what's interesting about the drug is even though only about 10% of patients respond favourably, those patients can have very long control of their disease uh, with uh, ipilimumab. What we don't yet know is how to predict those patients. So unlike vemurafenib, where we can do a gene test on the melanoma and work out if the drug is likely to work, uh, for ipilimumab, we don't. Uh, and uh, it is a drug that has some difficult side effects because it can overstimulate the body's immune system and produce autoimmune diseases. So it can be quite troublesome to um, administer and it requires quite a lot of experience to uh, treat patients with it. The most dangerous is a bowel inflammation which can be quite serious, require hospitalisation. Uh, patients can have very significant diarrhoea and bowel problems. Uh, then there is an autoimmune skin rash, uh, but there is also potential autoimmune liver damage and damage to various endocrine organs. So all these things need watching and monitoring in patients on this drug and for that reason it's likely that it will be used mainly in specialised melanoma centres. Uh, neither of them is an approved treatment in Australia, although hopefully both will be uh, in the very near future. Uh, ipilimumab has just been approved by the TGA, but it's not yet on the PBS uh, reimbursement. Uh, so currently they're only available through clinical trials or specific hospital access programs. Uh, and that's likely to remain the case for, uh, I would think, at least another 12 months or so. Now, what will be the next step with these two drugs uh, is going to be very interesting because as we know there are patients with melanoma that spread to regional lymph nodes and while some of them can be cured with surgical treatment and sometimes we use drugs like interferon, we don't yet have any information of these two new drugs in that situation. In other words whether they can increase the risk uh, increase the chance of survival when used in an adjuvant situation. The only trials so far have been done in more widespread metastatic melanoma. So trials with ipilimumab in the adjuvant treatment for patients with melanoma in lymph nodes uh, are being done and trials with vemurafenib are being very actively considered. So if they prove to be very good in that situation, then their use will expand and they will become more curative treatments. And our thanks to Dr. Milward for taking the time to talk with us. Also thanks to all our guests, Dr. Gabar, Dr. Matten and Clinton Heal. That's all we have time for in this month. And remember, this program or any of our programs going back to 2008 are available on our website. That's ruralhealthwest.com.au. We're back on the 4th of October with a program focusing on Aboriginal health. Thanks for joining us.